and, and I've seen it day in and day out. Oh, I got given a map by a friend from his car and, you know, the throttle pumps aren't, aren't very good. And it's like, man, who knows what has been done here? Just start from scratch. It's going to save you so much time. Welcome to the HPA Tune In Podcast. I'm Andre, your host, and in this episode, we've got Mitch Smith joining us from Haltech Australia. Uh, Mitch is probably someone you may have already talked to if you have happened to ring the tech helpline at Haltech in Australia. He is manning the phones, helping people sort out their problems, getting their projects up and running with Haltech, and also offering assistance and advice with tuning specific questions. Uh, he is also heavily involved on a personal level with Anthony at Matux Racing. Matux, one of the big name uh, workshops over in Australia that are really at the forefront of the Nissan RB development. And quite a while ago, we'll, we'll drop a link to this in the show notes, we interviewed uh, Mitch at Matux Racing where he was actually working at the time on a bit of a sabbatical from Haltech. And we did a tech tour of what was at the time the fastest street legal R32 GTR in the world, King 32. That title has since fallen dramatically but Matux have wanted to step up the game and they now hold the outright world record for the fastest Nissan RB. Basically they took the same engine that they are running in King 32 and they just shoehorned that into a proper pro mod chassis. So no sort of prizes here for guessing that that combination was going to go fast but with a 580 on only its third pass down the strip I think it surprised even the people who were piecing that together. It's not often we get to sit down and talk about the intricacies of setting up, tuning and running a car at this particular level and Anthony's made no secret that he is out for blood. He wants to change the domination of the 2Js at the front of the sport compact drag racing world and he's well on his way to doing so given that the car has made so few passes down the strip. So we learn about what goes into making this combination work, uh, how a drag racing clutch works, the tuning philosophy that Mitch and Anthony use, how the boost is controlled, how the fuel is controlled and all manner of other bits of information that you just don't normally get to hear. So if you're interested in drag racing and RB performance, this podcast is a goldmine of information. Now before we get into the interview with Mitch, if you have not heard of High Performance Academy before, maybe you're fresh to this podcast, High Performance Academy is an online training school. We specialize in teaching people how to tune factory and aftermarket engine management systems, how to build performance engines, how to construct reliable wiring harnesses. We also to cover topics on race driver education, car setup, fabrication and data analysis. There's a lot in there. You can check out all of our courses at hpacademy.com forward slash courses but relevant to our tuning topics today are of course our tuning courses. These include our EFI tuning fundamentals course which will teach you how the ECU works, what it's actually doing, how the fuel and ignition affect the way the engine runs and how we approach optimising those aspects aspects. Getting into the practical element, we have two courses. We've got our practical standalone tuning course, perfect for those of you who want to learn to tune an aftermarket standalone ECU, maybe a Haltech, a, a Motec, an AEM or any other of the aftermarket brands out there. It doesn't matter. Also, we've got our practical reflash tuning course, which is perfect for those of you who want to learn how to reflash a factory engine management system. And we talk at the end of the podcast to Mitch about his latest project car, which is the GR Yaris and his adventures in learning Win OLS and reflashing on that particular platform. You will find those courses that I have just mentioned in the show notes and as a podcast listener you can use the coupon code PODCAST75 and that will get you 75 bucks off the purchase of your very first HPA course. Alright with our introduction out of the way let's get into our chat with Mitch now. All right, welcome to the podcast, Mitch. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, as we usually do when we get started here, I just want to find out a little bit about your background and how you got involved specifically with tuning. It is, as we we all know, a, a really 
niche industry to break into. So what was your sort of initial foray into tuning? How did that, how did that sort of come up? Yeah, uh, well, thanks for having me, first of all. Cars were a hobby of mine, I think, like probably a lot of people that, that get into tuning. I remember from a young age, I was always playing with cars and like got into RC cars and that sort of stuff when I wasn't old enough to have the real thing. And then, yeah, once I got my driver's license, um, my very first car, I was pulling apart, did a manual conversion to it. Um, and what sort from of car there, are we talking here? Man, it was a Toyota Corona. Nice, nice, nice. So, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, it just sort of snowballed from there. As I got older, I left school and actually got into the IT field. And that sort of gave me the money that I needed for the really expensive hobby that's modifying cars. Do you find that that IT background crosses over? I mean, obviously, you don't need to be an IT specialist to tune cars, but th- there's got to be a few parallels there. Yeah, for sure. So... Definitely the computing skills are something that you definitely need with modern cars nowadays, like just knowing how to find your way around a laptop um, is very beneficial, but probably more so is the the fault finding and the diagnostic skills that come from from working with like commercial IT stuff. So, you know, if you're in a company trying to get a whole heap of peripherals working in, a, in an office environment or whatever, you know, you sort of need to understand how all those systems work together. and I think from that, there's a lot to take uh, and apply in, you know, in setting up a uh, like an ECU in a car, for example, and also the software side of things too. Like that's just a, it's just a natural skill that you sort of need to have, I think. All right. So manual swap on a Toyota Corona to to tuning. Sort of where did where did you get to a point where, hey, you know what, I, I need to be able to change the fueling, the ignition, or, or whatever other parameters. So how how did that develop? So by the time I started messing around with ECUs and getting interested in tuning, I had a 4A GZE A82 Corolla, and that just had the factory ECU, and I actually bought another one that had a some old Microtech thing in it, and I was like, oh, what's this little thing? It was like a hand controller style thing, so. Started playing around with that, you know, finding how to get through the ignition tables and things. And then from there, the next car was a, uh, a 180SX that I RB swapped and that copped a Niztune. So the Niztune was probably my first deep dive into like a fully featured ECU, I guess you could call it. Because, you, you know, you went from having a couple of fuel and a couple of ignition and idle tables in the Microtech to a like an OEM level. Um, style of ECU, albeit you know, quite basic. From my own recollection, I, I've dealt with this tune a couple of times, but not mm-hmm. for years. And, and from mm-hmm. my recollection, it, it's essentially uh, a way of making the factory Nissan ECU reflashable, which is what yep. we'd refer to it today. Um, as my memory serve me correctly there? Yeah, so it's a little daughter board that you fit into the factory Nissan ECU, and it sort of unlocks the their consult diagnostic and like programming interface I guess you'd call it and it comes with a software program that you just sort of plug in and you have a like a factory you know binary map file that you can load in and it gives you access to pretty much all of the tables to then you know edit at at your free will so it's all airflow meter based um, and yeah fairly basic compared to what you have nowadays in OEM ECUs but I think a really good introduction into how ECUs work in terms of tables for different strategies and things. And it's quite user-friendly. What I would say is, particularly when you're just getting started out, if you've got no prior knowledge of anything, I would probably argue that a, a basic standalone ECU is probably, for most people, an easier platform to get started with. Uh, you know, speed density system is pretty easy to get your head around. You've obviously got the manufacturer for support if you get stuck. And you know when you we break it down to to the basics, which on a on a simple RB really is quite basic. There's there's not a lot that you need to know. Whereas you look at even an older factory ECU like you're talking about there in the RB generation with NIS Tune, it's a, it's a very different approach to tuning. Would you would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. Um, for me, it was just more about price. A NIS Tune daughter board's a few hundred bucks, and you pull the PCB out of the ECU and attack it with a soldering iron and, and, and it's in and working. I love 
working things out for myself. So I did a lot of reading. This was sort of in the days where forums were still a massive thing. You know, there wasn't that much information out from individual people. Like if you wanted to find info on, you know, how to play around with a news tune, you, you were reading things written by people that had obviously spent the time. It wasn't just a Facebook post with a, a single sentence, you know, that you're getting your information from. So you're sort of in that situation of trawling through forums, trying to figure out who posting actually knows what they're talking about versus just posting what they think, sort of that that sorting fact from fiction scenario that a lot of us found ourselves in, and, and I mean, to a degree, obviously still exists. Yeah, definitely. And in hindsight, going with a plug-in standalone ECU probably would have got me a, a, a better and a quicker result. But again, I, I'm a sucker for, for learning how things work. And, you know, there I was armed with my Tech Edge wideband and my my laptop and my news tune and King Tuna sort of thing, and I had no idea what I was doing. So it was just a lot of a lot of trial and error. Let's talk about that trial and error because you know I I can I can understand where you're at. This is basically how how I got started as well. But but for our listeners, g- give us sort of a bit of an understanding. You know, you, you're coming into this essentially with no or very little knowledge. You've got fuel maps, you've got ignition, you've got boost, you've got a mass airflow sensor calibration as well. How did you go about figuring out, well, what airfuel ratio should I be shooting for? How much timing or boost or combination can I use and still hold this thing together? So again, a lot of a lot of research, a lot of reading. Obviously, very difficult to get any easily measurable way of seeing what I was doing if it was actually making a difference in the car. Dyno hire just wasn't a possibility. So, you know, everything was road tuning, looking down at a laptop, looking down at a wideband gauge to see what it was doing and then just sort of feeling, you know, the butt dyno as people call it. Again, though, like just just a lot of research, seeing what other people out there had done with a factory, you know, RB25 engine looking at different tables and maps. So the Nistune guys provide different bin files. So they had files out of like mines tuned ECUs, for example. So I could open those up and go, oh, that's interesting. They've got, you know, some ignition table numbers are a little bit bigger here and a little bit smaller here. And, you know, they give you the functionality to rescale the airflow meter and stuff. Like, why do I need to do that? That sort of thing. So a lot of trial and error and um, I guess just trying things and seeing what, what, what they did. That, that was the main thing. Like, it was my own car. I had nothing to, to sort of lose. Except the engine. Except the engine. Yeah, look, stock R33 RB25s aren't the most robust things from factory, but it was literally stock with, like, stock turbo um, with, like, an intake on it. So, you know, I'd go up the street and I'd just take 10 degrees of timing out of every, you know, out of the whole table and go, oh, that feels a bit weird. And then you'd put it back in and give it another few and go, oh, that feels a little bit better. So... I guess the engine likes it, you know, can't hear anything rattling or anything like that. And then same thing, you know, on the wideband, go for a run up the street, change the target lambda. Oh, yeah, that feels a little bit better or worse or whatever. And it was just that, like learning the relationship between like what you were actually changing and then what was happening in the engine, probably a little bit naive or a bit Rambo to be doing that, you know, on the street without a a way of measuring what I was doing but man I was 18 and I just wanted to do cool car stuff (laughs) let's be honest as well not everyone is going to have access to a dyno and I mean even these days dynos are obviously much more uh, common than back when you or I got started in tuning but but still the access to those can be hit and miss particularly when you're you know 16 18 or, or thereabouts and, and wanting to tune uh, I'm interested just to talk a little bit about uh, the ignition timing and and knock obviously that that's something that sort of goes hand in hand and you in my opinion at least knock is probably the quickest way to destroy any engine so it's something we do need to stay away from um, I if I remember correctly, there is a knock control strategy in those older Nissan ECUs, which I'm probably going to go on a limb and guess is, is probably not that flash. But you mentioned they're listening for, for rattle. I'm guessing you're talking just using your bare ears at this stage, or were you using a, a knock audio knock detection system? Nah, just purely just listening for that noise. <laughs> I always used to ask my dad, like, you'd be sitting in the passenger seat of the car and you'd be driving up a hill and you'd hear, you know, these cars going up the hill and they're making this w- really weird ticking noise as they're going up the hill. And I always used to ask, Dad, what's that? What's that weird sound? And I always remember, oh, that's that's you know that's pinging, Mitch. You'll you know you'll you'll work that out one day. 
<laughs> um, so yeah, just just listening out, and yeah, the, the news tunes do have a um, like a you could call it like a high and low octane table where it runs off the high octane table, and if the knock sensors go over the threshold, it just jumps into the low octane table, and it's quite easy to see that happening um, sure. in the news tune data. So put the numbers up till it jumps into the other map, and if it does that, take the numbers back out again, right? As long as it's actually accurately detecting knock, which is which is always the the challenge. I, I think a, a lot yep. of people these days believe that they're they're immune to knock uh, if they're dealing with either a factory issue with knock detection, uh, and definitely as well, the majority of mainstream aftermarket standalones now have had knock control strategies built in for for a you know, decade or so. Uh, my my opinion has always been that in both instances. Uh, unless it's an issue that I know intimately and, and I really trust the knock control strategy, and I'm talking here about factory ECUs, uh, I'll always use audio knock detection over and above while I'm validating that yes, in fact, the factory ECU can pick up knock when it's happening. And the reason I do this is because I've had scenarios go both ways. I've, I've had factory engine management systems uh, detecting knock that literally was was not there uh phantom knock often it, it's referred to as and it can be an, an element of uh, a mechanically modified engine with maybe forged pistons with uh, a little bit more noise being generated due to piston to wall clearances uh and it's it's just giving a noise profile during operation that's triggering that knock control strategy needlessly so obviously no danger there other than you're losing power needlessly but I've also had it the other way where the knock control strategy is showing absolutely no activity and I'm audibly hearing this thing knock its head off which obviously is the the more dangerous so I like to validate that yes it's actually working and if we talk about the aftermarket standalone strategies well yes they have these knock control strategies built in they still need to actually be set up and programmed they don't work out of the box it's not a, a, a silver bullet to, to protect the tuner and make them immune so I think audio knock detection at least for me uh, is very important and while I don't want to sort of flog this to death I will also mention because I'm seeing this a lot in internet forums uh, Facebook groups at the moment obviously over the years E85 as a fuel has become much more commonplace it's easier to get and uh, a lot of the turbocharged cars uh, you know people are running them on E85 because it's easy to make a lot more power and I think there's also a, a, a new generation of tuners that have come through never having to tune an engine on pump gas where the octane isn't sufficient they're tuning on E85 knock really isn't an issue so they kind of don't actually understand the dangers of knock yeah you, know, you deal with a lot of tuners through Haltech which we'll talk about shortly but but do you agree with that um, that sort of statement? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think you touched on something that I'm pretty passionate and, and a big advocate for, and that's validation. So just because you're hearing or seeing or feeling something, you know, you may have a lot of experience in whatever you're tuning or whatever you're doing, but just because, you know, a number is telling you something or, or you can hear something, I, I feel like validating that is very important. So, you know, you mentioned before, OEM ECUs have, you know, really good knock detection and control strategies but who's to say that you know there's not something loose on the engine that it's picking up or a knock sensor has gone bad or something um, and whether that's you know like you said pulling power when it shouldn't be or not pulling power when it should be I definitely think that yeah trusting a number on a screen sometimes you need to yeah get out and have a look or put, put the headphones on and, and actually have a listen it's definitely yeah, yeah definitely something I agree I agree with yeah I mean, I think and I've said this in podcast episodes before, but I, I think it bears uh, repeating. A, a lot of people, and I've I've been guilty of this myself. A lot of people will be sitting in the comfort of the the driver's seat on the dyno with the laptop there, and, and there's a problem, and you just want to stay in the warmth and comfort of that <laughs> seat and fix it with the laptop. And sometimes you need to actually take a step back and get out of the car, go and have a look in the engine bay and, and, and see maybe it's a mechanical issue. So I think recognising that quickly and early uh, really can fast track uh, your tuning process. Now let's fast track our conversation here and, and sort of get a little bit more up to uh, modern day. So how did you sort of progress from uh, messing around with NizTune and Microtech to actually becoming uh, employed at Haltech? 
at the time that I started getting involved with Haltech, I had a, an R34 GTT that I had actually bought it off a friend of mine and he bought it completely stock and I helped him modify that all the way up to where it had a built uh, automatic transmission, a uh, built three liter, 26 head, running an F-Con piggyback of all, of all things. Um, I eventually bought that car off him and blew the motor up, built a, a pretty serious 3.4 liter stroker for it put a big precision on it, redid all the fuel system. And while I was there, I pulled all the electronics out of it because it had an F-Con and it had a, you know, an AVCR boost controller and it had just, oh, just shit everywhere. So I thought, oh, well, let, you know, I'll, I'll go standalone and that can be, you know, my, the next sort of thing to learn. And did my research and, you know, came across Haltech, found that they had a really cool Platinum Series ECU that I picked up and... Yeah, just sort of working with them back and forth. I was getting in touch with their tech support guys a lot, bouncing questions. You know, they were always great answering every question I had, no matter if it was dumb or, you know, not even specifically Haltech related. Uh, And the tech support guys were just awesome. And, And at the time that I was in the IT field, I was sort of getting a little bit bored of it. I was finding that I was going to work five days a week just to really look forward to being able to play with my car all weekend. And so, I noticed on their website one day they had an opening for a tech support position. And so, yeah, I just thought, man, what, what's the worst that can happen? They can, I can go and quit IT for a bit. And if it doesn't work out, then I can just go back. And yeah, almost 10 years later, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still there. I never left. <laughs> um, <laughs> no desire to go back to the IT field. No, no, no. I mean, cars, I think so. the, the, the old saying you do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. It really does hold true. So, I mean, if you can yeah. find a way to work in something you're passionate about, um, you know, we spend probably a third to half of our life working. So we might as well be doing something that we're enjoying and passionate about, I believe. Yeah, 100%, definitely. All right, so you've obviously seen a massive evolution in the aftermarket standalone world uh, in that 10 years that you've been working with Haltech. I don't want to cover every single element, but is there any sort of key parts that, that stick out in, in the development of the Haltech brand that you think have been really pivotal to the success of Haltech as a product? Yes, I think that the Haltech product is heavily customer driven. We take a lot of feedback and a lot of input from what customers ask for and we put that into the ECU whether that's you know like hardware design for a new generation or firmware upgrades for additional functionality and things like that so over the time that I've been there the platinum series was sort of the platinum sport series was finalized we did some platinum pro plugins which are like the direct plugin applications on the older generation ECUs obviously the elite series which um, is almost pretty much as old as the time that I've been at Haltech for, and then obviously now the new Nexus Nexus series that, that's that been out for a couple of years. So through that sort of evolution of product, you can see that if, you know, every evolution, the products do more and you get more value for money out of them. So uh, a good example of that is with the Nexus series, the more we got into our ECUs being fitted on uh, pro mod race cars, for example, um, the more requests we got for, you know, we're sick of having, we want to run 16 or 18 injectors and we want to, we don't want to have separate boost controls. We don't want to have separate uh, traction control modules. We want, we just want to deal, we want, we want one USB cord so that when we're at the track, we just plug in and we can change everything. And so from that, from years of feedback from racers asking for these things, that's, that eventually became the Nexus R5. Sure. Um, so I think that's probably yeah the massive driving force for Haltech is is taking what customers actually want and then building a, a, a or specking the product around that. You just touched on something interesting there about these these multiple separate controllers, and you sort of mentioned that as well back with the the GTST R34 GTST with the FCOM piggyback plus the AVCR boost controller. Yep. And, and I mean, I've seen that shift as well. When I was heavily involved in drag racing, uh, there were the, the standalone boost controllers that everyone was running at, at the pointy end of the, the field with turbocharged yep. cars. Uh, yep. There was the the uh, ignition control box and traction control, and then you had your actual ECU. And it always... It always seemed to me to be a bit of a weird way of doing it. I mean, for me personally, I, I like 
to have everything in the one location so I can control it through one piece of software. And I always feel that if I've got that complete integration, it's going to provide a, a better result and a more seamless product. Um, but but still, up until probably not that long ago, we still had this situation. So what was the shift in, in that drag racing world of the mentality of multiple controllers through to one? So we had um, the Elite Series and uh, the Elite 2500 had eight, eight injector and eight ignition. And we found that you know a lot of the high-end V8 drag racing guys weren't running eight injectors you know that they all run 16 plus maybe another couple in the in the intake pipe or whatever and so to sort of cater for that we rejigged the elite 2500 with a custom firmware that sort of made it a slave box so you got an additional eight fuel injector drivers um, and then all of the additional io that was on that secondary unit so you'd have two basically two ecus in the car those ECUs don't have onboard wideband, so you'd also then have an external wideband controller. If you wanted EGTs, at the time we only provided a four-channel or a two-channel EGT box, so you'd then have two CAN bus EGT boxes. And so from that, you've now got six or seven or eight you know, Haltech boxes in your car, and that sort of became a, a running joke with Haltech. It was like, yeah, you buy the ECU and then you buy all the boxes. And I've seen the memes. You've seen the memes, yeah. So, however, however, that's still a different that's a different angle because yes, you've got these multiple boxes, but essentially they are still all communicating through yeah. to one hub, and, and and you're controlling and accessing the data there. So I'm I'm more talking about the like let's say the standalone boost controller, just as one example. So a non yes. a non Haltech product on a car yes. that's otherwise Haltech. So yeah, just that that angle was more what I was focusing on. What why was that a popular approach with the top level turbocharged drag cars using a standalone oh, boost controller right. gotcha. as opposed to bringing that inside sure. the ECU? Because even at the time, I mean, every aftermarket standalone ECU had a boost control strategy. Yes. I think probably, I mean, from, from my experience, the guys that were running those external boost controllers, maybe those controllers had some additional functionality or maybe had a control strategy that was a, a selling point for them over, you know, something that's built into a, an engine management system. So one thing that comes to mind would be like the AMS series controllers that were very, very popular where they have like a CO2 uh, dome pressure control strategy. And then from that, you then have timed boost ramps and things like that. And I also think the other thing that is maybe an attraction to external controllers is, yes, it's a separate thing to configure and set up. But if you don't know anything about engine management, but you know that you need to put five pounds more boost on the top of the wastegate, well, pressing a couple of buttons on an external controller is very easy to do versus plugging in a cable, going online with something and then finding that table in you know in, in your laptop software to then change that value. Yeah, one one point that that comes up as you're talking about that is you know, drag racing in particular, the track evolves throughout an event. Maybe you're in the staging lanes and uh, the, the track has clearly gone away. It's very easy if you've got that external boost controller to pull a few PSI out potentially uh, without needing to run back to the pit and grab a, a, a laptop. So yeah, I, I guess with everything that there are pros and cons for sure. Uh, let, let's move on to your to your role at Haltech. So you are in tech support, and and as such, I'm guessing you you're going getting a, a range, a very wide range of of questions and problems that come up. I'm interested. Are there are there any sort of consistent questions you you get asked that that are worth addressing here in this podcast? Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, we get a huge range of questions from a huge range of users that have different experience levels so we'll get questions from guys that have never touched an ecu before and have just you know bought all the stuff and want to chuck it in their car and are very keen and we also get questions from guys that have been doing it for longer than i have i find that a lot of questions we get asked are all due to people having difficulty doing ecu setups and installations so a lot of questions about base maps and startup maps and and giving us a list of mods that their engine has and sort of expecting us to spit a map out that they can just chuck in and, and put in the ECU. Yeah, I, I think I, I get that. We we get the same sort of questions as well, and, and it's something I've tried to address through our practical standalone tuning course in so much as uh, you don't need a base map. Uh, and, and in fact, quite often, if you're relying on a base map, 
particularly one that's been sourced not from the manufacturer themselves, but maybe from a forum or a maid or a maid of a maid or whatever, more often than not, because unfortunately the, the level of knowledge in the tuning industry is in, in general quite low, you're likely to find that those base maps actually have mistakes or baked in errors that you may not initially find. So it's it's so much easier in my opinion if you understand the process to actually configure and set up from scratch and essentially build your own base map. And it's not that difficult, right? Yeah, 100%. If it's a product specific application, so say for example, if it's an ECU with a uh, an adapter patch harness that has specific inputs and outputs on certain pins, 100%, there should be a base map for that because you know the, the the user shouldn't really have to dig through documentation to sit down and say, okay, well, you know, the injector outputs are on these wires and the boost control is on this output. In that sense, definitely product specific base maps are a must have. But yeah, when it comes to you know, setting up a, an ECU to run on an engine, it is, it's just a simple step-by-step process. You know, you tell the ECU, the engine it's connected to, what type of sensors you've got. Uh, and from there, it, 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 it's really, really simple and definitely agree with you. And, and, and I've seen it, see it day in and day out. Oh, I got given a map by a friend from his car and, you know, the throttle pumps aren't, aren't very good. And it's like, man, who knows what has been done here? Just start from scratch. It, it's going to save yep. you so much time. Yeah, the, the other thing that um, is really worth mentioning here that I know is super easy to overlook, I could have, well, back when I ran my workshop, we were, we were doing a lot of 4G63 combinations and we had our sort of favourite recipe of, of parts that we would put on a 4G63 and we knew within reason that that was going to produce X result when we hit the dyno. And while I had maps that I would use as a starting point, even two engines that in theory were identical with exactly the same turbocharger, injectors, intake, intercooler, everything, there would be small fluctuations, variations between one map and another in terms of the fueling and and the ignition timing. So people have this in their mind that if they give you a complete list of everything that their engine's got, you're going to be able to spit out this map that's just going to be perfect. And clearly it's not that way, is it? It's not that simple. You still oh, no. need to actually individually tune on the dyno. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. In saying that, though, with how good speed density is and the default maps in our EC, in Haltech ECUs have, in my opinion, very, very good ballpark values for pretty much everything. So, yeah, you might have a four-cylinder high compression engine and then also a two-valve, you know, big block V8, and the default VE map in both of those. ECUs is still going to get the engine running regardless of what what combo you've got. They still need to be tuned, but a good default set of maps in an ECU is going to get the job done regardless of of what you've got. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think we'll talk about this in a bit more detail. But I think that's one of the advantages of that move to a volumetric efficiency based tuning model. Uh, but you know, the, the the base map or base VE table, as you just mentioned, an ignition table, enough to get the engine up and running. I think that's really valuable because let's say we've got a new build and maybe we're not even going to tune the car ourselves. We've got no intention. We've, we're an enthusiast. We've built a car in our, our back shed and we're going to take it to a, a qualified tuner to get it actually dialed in. But Of course, before we go to the dyno and waste a bunch of time with the tuner getting it all bolted up to the dyno only to find that there's a wiring issue or a sensor issue or whatever else, it's nice to be able to actually get that engine running, basically go through a systems check. Might not be running perfectly, but at least if we could get it idling, get it up to temperature, make sure that the cooling system's working and everything's doing what it should, it gives a lot more confidence to take that car to the dyno and know that you're probably going to have a relatively seamless experience as opposed to never ever having the thing fired I don't think that generally works out too smoothly in most instances so just to come come back to the VE based fuel model can you give us a a broad rundown on what that terminology means and how that actually differs from the earlier injection time based models that Haltech and others have used yeah so the older injection time method was literally yeah, you just had a, a, a base fueling table that was load and RPM based. Um, Haltech on top of that then had a map correction whereby if you had double the inlet manifold pressure, then it would just double the fuel going into it. Um, so that was just a pretty much a, a raw lookup table. Wherever you are in the RPM and load, that was the that was the amount that the ECU opened the injectors for. 
speed density or volumetric efficiency, I think, has brought that tuning process down in terms of like the knowledge required. Not maybe not the knowledge required, but the thought that needs to go into it. You, you know, regardless of how big an engine is or how big your fuel injectors are, a volumetric efficiency table should have a a, a, a very you know similar shape to any any other VE table. Um, that yeah. exists, so it takes a lot of the tuning time out. In, I, I, I feel it, it speeds that tuning process up, and it also gives a better result to letting the ECU do the fueling calculations based on intake air temperature and obviously you know like the sweat volume of the engine, the size of the injectors. It just simplifies things, uh, especially yeah. when it comes to changing things down the track. If you change your fuel injectors, well, that doesn't really change the VE of the engine. So theoretically, you should be able to just bang your new injector flow rate in there and things should run you know, uh, pretty similarly, if not the same, versus an injection time where you would have to go through and, and literally change everything. Yeah, yeah, I, I 100% agree. I mean, back when I started tuning, uh, volumetric efficiency based ECUs didn't exist in the aftermarket world. So we were injection time. And the, the classic is just what you, you mentioned there. We'd do a tune for a customer, would be at or near the limit of the injectors, and then they want to go a little bit further. So they come back with a, 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 a upgraded set of injectors. And and literally, it was a case of almost without fail having to go back and, and remap the entire fuel table. And I think I'll, I'll clarify for those who maybe aren't following along, when we go to a volumetric efficiency based fuel model, that VE table, the efficiency table we've got, it actually, it, it's defining in simple terms uh, the mass of air entering the engine at each combination of load and RPM. So if the ECU knows what mass of air is entering the engine, uh, we'll have some other tables that define what size injectors are fitted and then we've got another table which is our air fuel ratio lambda target so if it knows what air is going to the engine the massive air the lambda target and the size of the injectors then it knows what pulse width to deliver to the injectors in order to achieve our aim so a nice function with that is as as you mentioned mitch if you swap to a bigger set of injectors for example literally just put that data into the ecu and as long as it's accurate it should start and run pretty much as it did on the old injectors. And then the other aspect is if we've got our engine all tuned, and let's say we've uh, we've tuned it at wide open throttle to 0.78 lambda, and we want to do a dyno run and see how it performs at 0.82, you don't have to go through and change anything in the efficiency table. It's literally just go to that lookup table for lambda, change our target. If everything's working, should get a seamless result straight on our target. So uh, definitely, I, I agree. I mean... In terms of simplicity of getting up and running on a VE based ECU, should be able to literally set the entire efficiency table to a value of maybe 50 or 60%. That should be enough to get the engine up and running. No, it will not be right. It's going to need work. But again, just the ability to get that engine up and running and tested, uh, yep. that, that's as simple as it is. 100%. All right, let, let's move on a little bit. Uh, as part of your your sort of work with Haltech, you obviously deal with a lot of the big workshops around Australia and particularly based in Sydney, so so Sydney. Uh, we know that you actually sort of took a sabbatical for some time from Haltech and ended up working directly at um, Matux Racing, who are uh, one of the big players in the RB market, uh, among the other vehicles that they tune. So can you talk to us a, a little bit about that sort of change in, in direction with your time at Matux? So I'd been at Haltech for quite a long time and obviously you start to develop relationships and friendships with a lot of the customers. Um, Anthony Matuk was, was definitely one of those and obviously me playing around with Skylines and RB engines at the time, that was something that you know he and I shared a common interest in. Um, and so from that, I found myself um, down at their workshop after hours and on weekends, you know, just hanging out and helping them with, you know, with cars and, and ECU installs and tuning. Um, and then from that, yeah, Anthony just basically approached me and said, hey, man, you want to come work for me and do this full time? And again, I thought, you know, no, no, nothing to lose. So I went and, and worked there, ended up being there for exactly a year. And I think that I wasn't really what he needed in that workshop at the time. So we just made a mutual decision for that I was going to go back to Haltech. And I'm still, a, you know, a resource to him. Uh, and so, yeah, we still work very closely together and I probably spend more time helping him than I did before I was working there. <laughs> um, 
But no, he and I share very similar tuning philosophies, I guess you'd call it. We all, when we're at the track and a car comes in and we're looking through the data together, you know, we'll, we'll finish each other's sentences when it comes to changes we should make. You know, hey man, do you think we should do this? And he'll say, yeah, we need to, you know, change the boost target by this amount. And it, it'll be the exact number that I had in my head. It's quite, it's uncanny at times. So just um, like any good marriage. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So they've been really good for, for Haltech as a, as a, a brand as well. They're a very good dealer of ours. Every single vehicle that goes through their shop gets a Haltech ECU now. now. I'll mention that last time we caught up in person, you were working at Matux and we actually did a tech tour on, I think what at the time was the fastest R32 GTR street registered car in the world, which was King 32. And before I get absolutely slammed, yes, that uh, that has moved along. That's the great thing about records. They're made to be broken and there has been some pretty fierce uh, competition in Australia. I think uh, just recently Croydon's went 6.37, yep. which, which is, is absolutely insane. incredible. Yeah, full credit to them. However, M- Matux obviously, decided that um, trying to compete in a, a car that was never meant to be a drag car uh, wasn't it all, that, all that it was cracked up to be and just wanted to go as fast as possible so uh, more recently they've actually fitted the RB engine into a pro mod chassis as I understand it and now have the world record for the fastest RB outright. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about what that uh, what that project's all about? Yeah for sure so yeah the last time that you and I talked uh, about King 32. I believe that that was still a cast engine in that Correct. and they were running low sevens. Um, so pretty much straight after that, they switched to doing billet engines only for, for that sort of power outlet uh, output. And their engine program has just developed from there using King 32 as the test bed. So, you know, Anthony would uh, try new techniques for head gasket sealing and try different techniques for uh, cylinder head, you know, port profiles and things like that. And the engine basically developed to the point where you're just wasting your time trying to measure the performance of the engine in a 30 year old, you know, four wheel drive chassis that's just not meant to do what it's doing. And so Nader, who owns King 32, uh, purchased the, the, the Pro Mod chassis from, uh, from Puerto Rico. And that was the X uh, Zoyon car, which is a had a 2JZ and was at one point, I think, the quickest import in the world. It ran pretty deep into the fives from my, my memory. Yeah, mid yeah mid fives from memory. Um, and so, yeah, the idea there was, well, we'll just take the engine out of King 32 that we know makes good power and it has been enough to push that, you know, 1600 kilo chassis well over 200 mile an hour, put that into a Pro Mod chassis and like the recipe's there, right? We know it makes the power. You put it in a chassis that's five, six, seven hundred kilos lighter, it has to perform. And so once the chassis arrived and it, you know, it wasn't really what was advertised. Um, <laughs> they thought they were getting a five second roller and it was, you know, it had been dropped off forklifts and it had no the wrong suspension in it and the fr- whole front end of it was all bent and Excellent. so yeah, so um they basically rebuilt that chassis from scratch um, and they've just gone the best of the best with everything. The engine in it is no different to what's in, you know, the, the King 32 and the other big horsepower cars that they run there. Stepped it up in terms of turbo size and things like that. But yeah, it's a pretty, pretty cool and interesting car. All right. So how, how fast has it gone so far? PB on the car. Uh, currently is it's gone 582 uh, at 242 and that was actually on its third full pass that it that it did that it's a pretty promising start just about off the trailer yeah look off the trailer um, it went a 1060 foot and once we looked at that time card and saw that uh, it wasn't a full pass it was just like well you know if it can at least go 220 like it like you know that the, the the GTRs have gone with a 1060 foot, it, you know, it has to go a, a time that's going to make people's jaws drop. The first full pass, it went a 6.3. And when we got the time card back, it had actually measured like a 1.5 60 foot. And when we watched the video footage back, it actually, the car broke the beams and sat there 
<laughs> for about half a second <laughs> uh, before it actually left. So once we saw that and and worked out that well, it didn't actually go one five sixty foot. It probably did the same, if not quicker. And then the time cards come back and it's gone six three or something like that. It was like well. That's the five second pass, right? And the Definitely. very, very next pass, it went 585. That's got to be really satisfying. Uh, satisfying, yes. I think mind blowing is, you know, I, I thought it was just absolutely incredible. But you know, again, you, you take a known combination that you've been running for quite a few years now and you put it in a chassis that's designed to do exactly that. And it did exactly what we all knew it would do. Yeah. It, it, there shouldn't be too many surprises, yet I've been involved in drag racing for long enough to know that uh, it, it's not always as simple as taking package A and putting engine B in it and getting the synergy that those two units should provide. Often there's a, a few challenges in the way. One of the biggest ones that I would assume needed some some work to overcome is with the drivetrain. Obviously, the R32 GTR four-wheel drive, albeit when these cars are launching with the front wheels in the air, you, you do have to wonder exactly how much benefit the four-wheel drive system is providing. But basically, as I said, all of the, the R32 GTR competitors who are serious about going fast on the drag strip have ditched uh, a manual transmission and gone to an auto. And that helps with consistency. It doesn't unload or reduce the torque and uh, on the gear shift, and also just getting them to to launch consistently is so much easier. You go to a pro mod chassis, and we, we talked before we came on camera here. We came started recording about the the fact it's running a, a, a clutch transmission. And if, for those who aren't familiar with what that term means in, in a drag racing sense, yes, it's a, a, a conventional clutch like a, a normal manual transmission street car, but there's a few more smarts to an adjustable drag racing clutch that uh, make it very different. Can you talk to us about what how that clutch works and what you need to do with it? Yep, for sure. So the car runs a, an EZ Motorsports clutch from America, and they've been excellent you know, with helping us to tune the clutch because it is a, a whole extra thing that you need to basically tune a, a, and adjust depending on the conditions and the how the engine operate, what RPM the engine operates in and that sort of stuff. So it's basically a, a clutch that has your traditional style of pressure plate that also then has a centrifugal assist to that. So that's some counterweights that run on some additional fingers and pretty much the harder you spin the engine, the more centrifugal force there is, which then helps the clutch lock up harder so the idea is you run some amount of slip on the clutch for the first x amount of time in the run uh, and then once you're out of that zone where you want the clutch to slip the rpm of the engine then helps that clutch clamp down harder with centrifugal force so there's a lot of setup in uh, air gaps and preloads and heights on um, things in the clutch and then there's also a pneumatic ram that basically prevents uh, those centrifugal weights from having any effect until you want them to that style of drag racing clutch was my first sort of introduction into into tuning them and and uh, helping the guys with data so very important with those is having an engine rpm signal and a and a gearbox input rpm signal so you can actually measure the amount of slip and you want that data at a reasonably high frequency as well too yes correct? yeah for sure yeah definitely um so using that data working with the the guys that look after the clutch generally you'll you'll have a a specific person on on the team that that's their sole job the car comes back after a run the gearbox comes out you know the clutch is measured and readjusted if it if need be because consistency is is very important when it comes to yeah to those style of clutches and a bit of a bit of a black a black magic black art i think yeah i i agree from from my time involved with the lights of the heat treatments gtr which ran a, a slider style clutch uh, i mean it, it's very maintenance intensive as you say you've got to bring, pull the gearbox out after every pass reset yeah. the uh the the base height the air gaps and then from there that just gets you back to that starting point because of course you're in, intentionally slipping the clutch out of the hole out to whatever point it's it's fully locked up. So the the reason that we do that is it, it sort of 
allows the the car to leave without bogging and without just lighting up into wheel spin. So we're sort of riding that that sweet spot of just getting the the, the tires rotating and and allowing it to sort of catch up with the engine RPM before we clamp up. So get it right, and, and your sixty foot is is going to be mega. But of course, there's a, there's a lot of room for error and. Every time the track conditions change, the clutch setup needs to be changing as well. So having having a clutch guy that that really knows their stuff and is able to get on top of that that that's really key, as I see, to getting one of these clutch cars to to work. The other aspect is that the clutch setup will also differ with the way the engine power is being produced and with the launch RPM. You've got that centrifugal element, which as you mentioned, as the engine RPM increases, so does the centrifugal force, so the clutch will tend to lock up harder. So what's the sort of, as as an engine tuner with a drag car, how are you working with the clutch person to sort of decide on changes to a launch strategy? So you can control the launch RPM, obviously with a two-step, and you can also, in essence, control the boost pressure that the engine's going to leave with. So are you in consultation with the clutch guy to sort of decide what changes to make? Yeah, so I sort of touched on that before with consistency. So that's also consistency with with the engine side of things. So Anthony and I sort of bounce back and forth on what a good RPM and, and boost pressure would be as a starting point uh, to leave with in, in the car. And we picked a, a certain RPM and a certain, certain boost pressure. And then we basically tuned the the launch control strategy to be exactly that every time. So once you've got that sorted and consistent, then it's sort of the clutch guy's job to to work to that. Um, so rather than bouncing back and forth and changing things on on at both ends, on the engine and on the clutch, we've picked one RPM and boost pressure to leave on and the clutch guy works to that. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. In terms of boost versus gear or you know time down the drag strip uh, how how are you sort of can, can you let us know how that works are you starting with a, a reasonably low boost and then ramping it up quite quickly or are you the same boost from the start line to the finish line no so the there's no wastegate on that car we took a page out of rod harvey's book and um no wastegate fitted on that so it's a it's a very simple method to control the boost level in that car it's basically a a co2 wastegate on the inlet pipe it turns out if you put 20 pounds of co2 on top of a wastegate you get 20 pounds in the engine regardless of what the turbo is doing so um, that simplified things massively for us so it's just a race timer based control we start with x amount of pressure on the top of the gate at the start of the run and about one and a half seconds in it's got as much on top of the gate that the co2 bottle can provide so in, in essence, you are asking for everything that that turbocharger can provide. Yeah, yeah, exactly. One, once you're one and a half seconds down down the strip or whatever that may be. Yeah, correct. Okay, that sounds like a scary proposition. Obviously, anyone with a, a street car with a turbo on it, the, the wastegate is pretty critical to keeping the the boost under control and and in turn keeping the engine in one piece you know are we at a point with these turbochargers where we just can't get as much boost pressure as we actually want we can't move enough air uh to to make more power that's the limiting factor on these engines yeah and i think that for this specific application we don't want to run low boost We, we, we want to use every single every single part of the energy coming out of that engine we want to use to spin that turbo to to make the boost because the aim is to go as quick as possible and to make as much power as possible so yeah that that, that's the idea there is we're not wasting anything you know all the exhaust gases go through the turbo and we get as much out of it as we can ultimately what sort of boost pressure are you seeing out of that combination then at the end of the at the end of the run um when anthony comes off the throttle it's a little bit over 100 pounds of boost and can you give us an estimate what's that sort of equate to in terms of the power that that engine's producing uh, on the hub dyno, we couldn't get any more than about 80 pounds out of it on the hub dyno. And at 80 pounds, it made um, a little bit over 2,500 horsepower at the hub. Okay. So you, you've got to be pushing on towards sort of closer to that 3,000 mark at the hubs with, with 100 plus. Yeah, has you to would, be. You would yeah. think. Yeah, it'd have to be 28 or 2,900 horsepower. It'd have to be. I'm interested just because you've mentioned the hub dyno there and just talking a little bit about tuning philosophy for for a drag car. Obviously the dyno is an amazing tuning tool, but 
also when we're talking about these sort of very high numbers, there's a huge amount of stress and strain involved. And we also have the ability to dial the car into the racetrack and the track always evolves and changes from one event to another or even during the course of an event. So th- there's usually small tweaks that are being made to to get the car to go down the track as, as well as it can. Uh, obviously you mentioned there you're sort of limited in terms of how much boost you could generate on the, on the dyno. If you had the option, are you of the opinion we're going to tune it to the maximum power that we, we run at the drag strip or do you use the dyno more as a case of let's get uh, ourselves into the ballpark at a lower power level where we're not really putting the engine under undue stress and strain and then we'll, we'll dial it in as required at the track. Yeah, and that's that's sort of how um anthony likes to do all of his cars is the dynos just there as a as a tool to get the car in the ballpark and you do the rest of the tuning at at the racetrack um because let's face it you know any engine that's 190 something cubic inches that's making that sort of power it it, it's got a, a limited lifespan and and there's sort of no point wasting it on the dyno trying to make every last horsepower when um, you know, if if you've got it the majority of the way there or in the ballpark, you, you can do the rest at the track. Yeah, I think I think that's easy for people to overlook who are just sort of casually watching, you know, Facebook groups or, or whatever where people are developing these cars. You know, it's very easy to overlook the fact that there is, as you say, a finite life on these engine components, and you know, every pull on the dyno, every run down the drag strip that's taking some amount of life out of that engine, which is also obviously a, a, a massive expense as well, correct? Oh, yeah, for sure. And the only reason we ran it up at that sort of boost pressure on the dyno was we were trying to um, fault find a, a leak in the inlet. And the only time that that leak would seem to appear was under you know, those sort of boost pressures. So um, that was the only reason that we, we ran it up on the dyno you know, okay. at, at full pressure. So in terms of what you're using from the data to develop the tune at the track, obviously that's the next question. If we're not tuning on the dyno and not getting that power figure to show us what our change that we've just made is given, what are the metrics that you're looking for from the data from one pass to another when you're developing that calibration at the track? So uh, ECU data logs are are massive. There are a huge amount of sensors on that car because it's one thing to keep an engine together, you know, to make that sort of power, but, you know, you need sensors for the clutch guy to help him work out if it's locking up or or it has the right amount of slip. There's shock sensors that you need to give to the, to the chassis guys to, to make shock adjustments and to make sure that um, all the suspension is doing the right thing. And and I don't pretend to know anything about that. So it's all about using the data, giving that data to the people that, that need it so that they can make their adjustments. And then at the end of the day, the aim of that car is to just go fast. So the measured metric, of course, is the incrementals on the time card. And if a change is made and and those incrementals come down, well, um, you know, you know, you're heading in in, in the right direction. And again, there's three time cards for that car so far. Mm. There's the 6.3, the 585 and the 582. And so not a huge amount of data just as yet. But not a huge come. amount of data just yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, the, the the more the more time that car spends on the track, you know, the more data we'll be able to get. And yeah, I mean, just full full credit to to everyone that's had a hand in that. For a car like that to go that quick on its third, second, and third pass, like it, yeah, it, it's pretty mind blowing. I think. Oh, and it certainly is impressive this early on in its development, and and does lead to. The obvious question, I mean, where, where do you sort of see its potential? Obviously, the 2JZ has reigned supreme for a hell of a long time now as the sport compact engine. Uh, I, can't even, I can't even remember where the, the world record actually sits at the moment, but pretty deep into the, into the fives. Uh, the, the RV has never really been a platform particularly outside of Australia, that has seen the level of support and development it's now getting. Um, I guess that puts, puts it a little bit behind the, the, two, the 2JZ in terms of, you know, you've got a number of competitors that have been developing that platform into the five-second zone for a long time now. But, um, I mean, yeah, from your perspective, is there any, any reason why the RB can't uh, run on a level playing field with the, the current crop of 2JZs? No, de- de- definitely not. And... It's it's 
it's Nader who owns the car and, and Anthony's dream with that and, and their aim of that car is to is to go number one on the on the import um, list. Uh, I think it's a 540 or something at the moment. So it's a long way off, but it's still very early days f- for this car. We've got a little few ideas here and there of, of how to bring that, that ET down. There's still a lot left in terms of the, the horsepower the engine can make. Um, we've still got a little bit left to go there. So very early days for the car. So I really hope that, yeah, it, w- we can eventually get there because that would be huge for, for a Nissan engine to, 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 to do that or, or even to do what it's already done. It's it's sort of opened people's eyes, I think, because as you said, the 2J has been the supreme, you know, import engine forever. God standard. Yeah, exactly. And for a for a, a little Nissan RB to come along and, and put itself um, in the middle of that, top 10 field it's yeah it's pretty cool definitely i mean on face value those listening might sort of go well 540 to, to 580 i mean we're talking four tenths of a second no no big problem but of course these become incrementally more difficult and more expensive to, oh, to yeah. shave off tenths yep. of a second the faster we go so i mean it, it, that, those four tenths still represent a, a significant lifetime of achievement but i mean it, it is a sound place to get started uh, in terms of getting more power, I mean, you, you've you've already sort of alluded to the fact that the turbo's sort of all in. Uh, we need to get more air into the engine in order to to make more power. So, where, where's the solutions there? Is is that a case of uh, switching to a different turbocharger, or is there more to it than that? A little bit more to it than that. Everyone sort of forgets that the engine combination, bar the turbo, in that car is identical to what Anthony puts in all of the street, like the high horsepower street cars. So in my opinion, there's probably something to be gained in cylinder head and camshaft profiles. It doesn't have uh, uh, an obnoxiously, you know, since overly ported cylinder head or obnoxiously large set of camshafts in it. It's just got, you know, a, a, a cylinder head program that he knows works really well. So there's probably something to be gained there. The engine is at the moment just all boost, so there is the possibility to move to like a nitrous system to help us add pretty much whatever we want to that. So once we hit a brick wall with the like the engine itself t- taking more airflow, then I think we'll move to uh, yeah like a, a nitrous power adder. Okay. In terms of the engine mechanically, without sort of diving into to anything sort of that's proprietary knowledge inside of it. Uh, obviously, the billet block is, is a key element in, in keeping a 2J or an RB alive at, at this sort of level. Have you got in mind, or has Anthony got in mind, sort of what what he considers to be the the upper level of of what that combination can can support? Because it's one thing to actually make the additional power, but but if the components aren't going to handle it, you know that that's not going to be a, a long lived experiment. So yeah, where, where's the sort of limitations lie? And maybe if we can go even further, what what are those limitations seen as being? We pulled the engine down after it had done the 582 just to have a look at it and see what was wearing and and if it had looked like it had any signs of of stress and that's the first time the engine had been sort of pulled apart from when it had first gone in the car so it had had all of the dyno tuning done and then obviously yeah the, the, the passes it ran at the track and it looked like it hadn't done any work at all inside um it's pretty mind-blowing to know what an engine's gone through in terms of the power it's made for the time that it's made it and to pull it apart and have it look like it had, you know it was a 300 horsepower street engine pretty incredible i think the materials and the technology that go into the billet blocks and and you know the the crankshafts and rods and everything nowadays um even even down to like the the coatings on the bearings that people run now like all of those small little advances in technology when you combine them all together it's incredible to see an engine come apart and and look like that Certainly would give confidence that uh, you're in a good place, or Anthony's in a good place to push it much further if that's what it's looking like after a 580. That's what I mean, yeah. It it doesn't look like an engine that's done any amount of hard work. So it was literally, we'll just slap it back together and we'll just keep going. Yeah, Um, yeah. Yeah, so at this point, you know, he's got his sort of recipe down for for what goes into the bottom end. He's got his recipe for what happens up in the cylinder head, and it, we, we haven't found any limitation there in terms of you know longevity or or wear and tear yet. 
Interesting. Uh, also, just to talk about the the head and the cam spec, because it, as you say, you know, the, this is a combination that Matooks are using on their street GTRs, and, and I say that with uh, a very loose terminology around street. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know how the cops over here in New Zealand would. Um, would put up with it, but uh, you know, street is what we're calling it. But I mean, any any combination that you can actually drive on the street and, and maybe take through your local Macca's drive-through, uh, that that does suggest that uh, there's probably a little bit of potential airflow on the table uh, if you actually went to a full race combination with a head and cam profile that was only uh, designed to to work over a very narrow RPM range at the top. So it'd be interesting to see uh, what what happens or what is it available in, in in that regard as time goes on. Uh, talking about the ECU control on on this particular engine, you know, we, we live in a time where closed loop control of, of all manner of functionality is, is the norm now. Obviously the boost control we've already touched on with the race timer and, and basically then it's all in. So we'll take that off the table. But with your tuning philosophy Closed loop fuel control, this is something that I, I know that, that very much divides tuners as to whether or not to use it. Uh, what's your, your take on that? Um, for something like this Pro Mod, I wouldn't want to rely on, on closed loop fueling. Um, that's another rabbit hole that you can get lost down very quickly when it comes to the sort of mixtures you need to run an engine at to keep it alive at, at that sort of power. And, I, and we found that not all O2 sensors uh, agree down at, at those sort of lambda values. So yeah, let, let's just dive into that a bit because we're talking methanol fuel here, which, which has we're running them incredibly rich compared to pump gas or, or E85. D can you give us a broad sort of idea of what that range might look like? And I'm not after a specific number, but yeah, the, the range that you might be in for a methanol fuel car at that sort of power level. So methanol fueled uh, car at this sort of power level, you're like well under 0.6, and that's a far away from where you'd normally be running. Yeah, like you mentioned, like a 85 street car where you're up at you know 0.8 or or something like that, 0.82. And that's actually sort of outside the the normal calibration range of a bunch of these these typical sensors we use as well, typical oxygen sensors, correct? Yeah, for sure. And working at Haltech, you know, I've been exposed to uh, the R and D process of getting a sensor to, you know, to to, to read on on an ECU, right? So um, our Nexus ECUs have onboard wideband controllers. So I've been exposed to the the R and D process of getting those controllers to control and talk to those to those sensors. And when you get feedback from customers saying your O2 sensors don't read properly down at these sort of lambda targets well it's like you need to sort of cross-reference that with what they're actually seeing from other brands and whatnot so that's been really eye-opening for me is that not all o2 sensors are are created equal and not all o2 sensors that are equal measure the same down at those sort of lambdas when you've got them controlled by different electronics so what I'm taking from this is we couldn't take a, a, a lambda target of 0.55, for example, that we know has worked reliably on X combination and just go, right, 0.55, that's my number. I'm going to apply that to every combination that I tune. It's not that simple. Definitely not. Not down at those sort of mixtures. Definitely not. Okay, so that leads me to the next little piece of the puzzle that you've got to work with there, which is, of course, exhaust gas temperature sensors. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take it that this is fitted with individual cylinder EGT sensors. Uh, are you using those two pieces of data there, Lambda and EGT, to help you decide on, on fueling changes? And I'm talking here overall. We'll dive into individual cylinder in a second. Uh, yes, yeah, definitely. Uh, overall, EGT values are are definitely used. Circling all the way back to what we were talking about earlier about speed density and volumetric efficiency. If I know that my VE numbers are in the ballpark when I'm running the engine at 0.68 or 0.7 lambda at those lower boost levels, well, I know I can make an educated guess that the VE values are going to slightly taper off. You know, as the engine gets less efficient, the more the more boost you jam into it, and so I know I already know that I'm going to be in the ballpark at those numbers anyway, because that's the beauty of VE, right? Is you can use the the, the shape of that table to to work out where you're going to be, even if you haven't been there yet. 
So in, in terms of a question that we always get asked, and, and this is really more around probably a pump gasoline or you know a typical race gas C16, Q16 question because the EGTs do do change with methanol. Uh, but the, the question we always get asked is, uh, what's the maximum safe exhaust gas temperature that I can run? And I'm, I'm interested to get your take on this. So again, I'm not trying to get specifics out of the, the Matux combination. Let's bring it back to, to pump gas. Is this, first of all, a question that you can answer? Definitely not. Perfect. Can you expand on that? And I'm interested to see what your take on this is. Uh, in terms of? Let's just make it in general why we can't sort of say this EGT XYZ, this is the maximum number that is going to be safe across the board. Yeah, well, I, I think you touched on it before, right? It depends on, on the, the type of fuel that you're running. It can depend on the the style of engine that you're tuning. It can even come down to who's installed the, the, the probes in the in the exhaust manifold. Like you can get hundreds of degrees of variance depending on the depth of that probe. I think that, that particular point there is one that's super easy to overlook. And and that's something that, that I spend a lot of time with any time I'm installing exhaust gas temperature sensors. It's the depth of the probe is inserted into the runner, but not only that, it's also the distance from the exhaust valve as well, because if we've got one that's maybe you know, 50 millimetres off the, the header flange and the next one's 75 millimetres, that, that additional distance is, is, all things being equal, going to actually measure a different exhaust gas temperature, correct? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and again, it comes back to, to validation, right? If you're seeing a, a hot EGT and you're not getting out of the car and physically looking at that probe to see that it's five mil into the runner more than the rest, and you don't see that and, and you're taking it on face value that it's actually hotter when it potentially isn't, it's all validation, definitely. So the other element w- which can play into this, and, and I'm sort of kicking it old school here, another question that, that does co- crop up quite often is uh, the the validity of plug reading in a car at the, the likes of Matux level. So we'll circle back to that now. So I mean, I'm interested to know when, when that, that thing's on the dyno or after a run down, down the strip, is plug reading something that you or Anthony are doing? Yes, definitely. And again, that's just to validate what we're seeing from all the other data. So if the Lambda sensor is telling it that it's it's close to being on target, the EGTs are telling us that all of the cylinders are outputting an, an equal temperature and all the plugs come out and they all look like they're burning identically, well then, you know, you've got three points of data there that all correlate to one another. And so you know that you definitely, you know, you can trust the data that you're seeing. Yeah. If the data comes back and one cylinder is hotter than the rest or colder than the rest, but you pull the plugs out and nothing looks any, di- you know, they don't look different to one another, well, then you need to sort of validate as to why that's happened. And you look down and I'll just push one of the EGTs out or something. Um, so, yeah, plug reading is definitely important. Uh, a spark plug lives in the cylinder. And so it's probably one of the best data points that you can have, in my opinion, for getting an idea of what's actually happening in, in, in the cylinder. Yeah, I definitely agree on that. I mean, I would say that you know, from my own perspective, when I was tuning anything that was really high horsepower, so our, our drag cars, for example, I, I would regularly pull plugs after a, a run on the dyno or a run down the strip and, and look at them. Not so much maybe we're tuning a, a factory road turbocharged road car and we're making 20% more power. Well, you know, at that level, it, no, I'm, I'm going to be more than happy relying on my, my Lambda sensors. So it, it's it's not a case, it, you know, it, it's horses for courses essentially, I think, and just understanding. Obviously, you're working at the very upper echelon of, of, of what a turbocharged engine is going to hold together with. So you want all of those data points and as much data that you can to, to validate what you're seeing and, and understand if you're on the right track. Now, I mentioned about individual cylinder tuning as well. So this is an aspect, I think it's easy to, to assume that every single cylinder is, is running uh, equally with the same air fuel ratio being combusted. That's, that's of course not always going to be the case. We've got differences in port flow from cylinder one through to cylinder six, obviously improved now with CNC porting, but still some variations and then the flow through the intake manifold, etc. So th- there's always potential for small variations. And again, at a, a low power level streetcar, even moderately modified, that's normally not such an issue. I should also mention there why I 
I bring this up is when we're looking at uh, the exhaust lambda or air fuel ratio, typically we've got a single sensor that is monitoring all of our cylinders, be that four, six or eight. So we can have a situation where one or two cylinders might be a touch lean and we've got another couple of cylinders that are a touch rich and overall the, the measured air fuel ratio, the average of all of those still looks to be on point. Uh, and as our power levels go up, those couple of cylinders or one cylinder that might be a touch lean, that becomes a problem. So long-winded way of asking, how are you using the exhaust gas temperature data to, to help with these trims? And what sort of typical trim would you expect to, to maybe see on a well-developed race engine from cylinder to cylinder? So definitely using EGT to, as you mentioned, make sure that the cylinders are balanced to one another. If you start to get an EGT that drifts away from from the trend or, or drifts away from where it usually is, you can use that to then start fault finding You know what might be causing that. So if it's the first time you run an engine up and you've got a, a, a hot EGT or a cold EGT on a certain cylinder, you need to first work out why that is. Is the probe in, as you mentioned, is the probe in the right spot? Um, or do you have a, you know, a dodgy injector or a dodgy coil or a cracked spark plug or something like that? Um, so yeah, definitely using that to make sure the engine's balanced. Uh, and then in terms of, you know, if it is just an airflow difference on that cylinder for whatever reason, whether it's a, a, a manifold design thing, as you mentioned, a lot of people sort of forget that the VE of an engine is not just the uppy downy roundy roundy bits. It's the it's the, the whole si- it's the system as a whole. So if you've got a, a badly designed turbo manifold that you know might bias the, the the exhaust flow on one runner different to another, that can also affect you know the the, the efficiency of of that you know particular cylinder if it has to work harder to get the the exhaust gases out compared to the one next to it. So yeah, for for a, for an engine that has a good design inlet manifold, a good design exhaust manifold, uh, I would expect that at idle you may see uh, some some larger differences, um, but under under load and under power, I would think that you need to be you know well under ten percent injector trim cylinder to cylinder, and if there was anything more than that, I would start to ask questions. Um, about what we can maybe do to externally fix that, whether it's got, you know, a, a lot of these engines run two or three injectors per cylinder, so you've got a huge amount of variable there. Anytime you pass that 10%-ish threshold, yeah, I would be looking at hardware to fix the issue. Yeah, yeah, all, all good information there. In terms of the the variation in EGT that, that you're looking for, uh, and just to clarify, I do, do you work in degree C or Fahrenheit? Either Fahrenheit's okay. fine. <laughs> All right. Well, let, let's stick to Fahrenheit. What what I'm interested in, sort of, what variation from from cylinder one through to six do you consider to be within within that realm? Because obviously they're not going to be within a degree of each other. No. There's always a, a bit of variation. But what are we talking here? You know, uh, 25 degrees Fahrenheit from hottest to coldest, or 50, or, or what? What's your sort of happy place? Um, my happy place is within 100 Fahrenheit of one another. I think that's a fair, realistic number. As you said, you'll never get them, you know, exactly the same as one another. But I feel like 100 Fahrenheit in the, you know, in the group is is I think a good range, and that makes it very easy to pick if something's, you know, going going wrong. Uh, it's easy to find a, a a cylinder that's drifting away from that grouping um, when it's, you know, sort of that in in that threshold. One nice feature, a bit of an aside, but one nice feature of having that individual cylinder EGT data as well, when when you've got a problem with an ignition misfire or something like that when the car's going down the strip, incredibly easy to pinpoint that down to an individual cylinder. And you know that that makes it so much easier to fix, as opposed to having a misfire, having absolutely no clue where it's coming from, and and wasting a bunch of passes down the strip until you actually figure out, oh, it was cylinder cylinder four coil was bad, and we actually finally got on top of it. So you know, there's other advantages to that data uh, as well. I find the other thing yeah. I'll point out here as well because. Really what we're trying to do here is infer the air fuel ratio from the exhaust gas temperature and and that's not as cut and dried as as maybe it would seem. And the the theory here is when we're running rich of stoic and we lean out a particular cylinder, the exhaust gas temperature will go up, we richen it, it goes down. So that's kind of why we're getting that inference between or correlation between air fuel ratio and EGT. But as I say, it's not exact and 
in, in the perfect world, maybe we'd have individual cylinder lambda sensors so we can directly measure the 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 air fuel ratio per runner. There's complexities with doing that and particularly doing that reliably pre-turbocharger, but I'm interested in your take. Is that something you've you've ever played with or considered? No, not something I've I've ever played with. I think on a turbocharged application, you, again, you touched on it. Exhaust back pressure obviously plays a big part in in what that sensor reads. And yeah, when you've got 80, 90, 100 pounds of, of EMAP, uh, I, I really don't know how you can reliably look at data from that sensor and be able to say, yes, that's definitely the mixture coming out of the engine. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it, it, people would probably not necessarily understand that the the uh, accuracy of the air fuel ratio data from uh, typical lambda sensors is uh, affected by that exhaust gas back pressure and typically when we've got the sensor post turbocharger that back pressure should be relatively low and I think from my memory the, the likes of the LSU 4.9 lambda sensor uh, the calibration data that Bosch actually give uh, they only actually run that up to 22 psi 1.5 bar I think of, of back pressure and in, in that's as far as they consider it to be reliable. And as you say, you know, 80, 90 PSI of, of back pressure, you're kind of, you're so far <laughs> off the chart, you can't see your way back. So yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and then there's also the aspect of keeping the, the sensors alive as well, which is a consideration. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, Mitch, look, I think we'll move towards wrapping this thing up. And we have the same three questions that we like to ask all of our guests at the end. And the first of those is, what's what's next for you in the future? Uh, talking about your own cars, your your sort of position at Haltech, your involvement with Matux, you know, what, what are you excited about? What's, uh, what's keeping you awake at night at the moment? Um, I bought myself a, a GR Yaris, um, which I thought was a, a pretty cool platform and a, a you know unique little car that I'd like to own. So part of the thinking with that was I've developed a bit of an interest in in flash tuning just as a, a personal you know extra little hobby. So that's sort of intriguing. I'd love to learn more about you know how modern OEM ECUs work. Um, there's now a method to flash those cars, flash the factory ECUs in those cars. So I'm really looking forward to getting lost in, yeah, pulling down binary files and working out what all the numbers do. Um, so you're doing that uh, right from the, the raw binary file with the likes of OLS or are you working yeah. with a, a reflash package? Yeah, so WinOLS, um, loading the raw bin file into that and and just sort of trawling through it, probably throwing myself in the deep end with that particular car because it's pretty modern and pretty different. Um, I probably should have started with a 350Z or something, but <laughs> <laughs> nothing like jumping in the deep end. Exactly, yeah. So that's something that sort of pricked my interest a, a little bit lately. Apart from that, man, what's next for me? Um, I'm really enjoying the where we're at with the, you know this this drag racing stuff lately. Having or being able to say that you had a hand in, you know, a, a five second import. I think that, yeah, that's probably something that I'm like dumbing down a bit, but I, I should probably be a little bit more proud of, of, of that achievement. It's um, a massive achievement. So I think to to help develop that car and for it to go quicker, that's something that, yeah, again, I'm, I'm really looking forward to. That'll be cool to see that go faster. I, I think a, a lot of people who have had no exposure to drag racing think of it as a, a bit of an unusual sport and... You know, how hard can it be to go fast in a straight line? I mean, I, I, I was passionate about it because I think as a tuner and, and personally as well as an engine builder, I always see that uh, the ET a mile an hour is the ultimate sort of expression of, of what your package can do. And, you know, there's nowhere to hide. Uh, you can't inflate your dyno figures. No one cares. The ET a mile an hour doesn't lie. And, and, you know, getting success, particularly at a world level, yeah, absolutely. Kudos to you. That That is a huge achievement and you should definitely be very proud. No, oh, thanks. No, I appreciate it. All right. The, the next question, Mitch, uh, you've obviously had a, a fairly broad experience to, to this point in your career. And I'm interested if, if you could sort of give any tips to a younger version of yourself, obviously those who are listening to, to maybe fast track your career and get to where you've got to. Um, yeah. What, what would those tips be, if any? Probably to go with your gut 
and if if you're doing something that you enjoy and you want to make it a, a a career just do it find that you know a, a lot of the choices that I've made in my life I've sort of held back from because of risk or um, concern that it might not work out but yeah uh, advice to a younger version of myself just just do it just as you said before just jump in the deep end and and stuff will work out I, I think what you mentioned a couple of times during our chat is worth just coming back to and that is when you went for example from Haltech to, to Matux and from IT to Haltech you know hey what's the worst that can happen if, if it doesn't work out yeah, you know, I'll, I'll go back to IT or, or go back to Haltech, which is exactly what you've done. So, you know, I think it's it's often scary to to put yourself out, stretch outside of your comfort zone, and do something new. But yeah, I mean that that is also where you grow and learn. And you know, if you go through life afraid to ever move out of your comfort zone, you, you're going to have a very limited experience. So, I think yeah, that that's really yeah. great advice. Hundred percent. Yeah, I agree. Right, last question for today. Uh, if people are interested in learning a little bit more about you, finding out what you're up to and following along the journey, is there anywhere uh, they can do that? Not big on the socials, to be honest. <laughs> um, look, if anyone you know wants to have a chat or get in contact or wants some input on their Haltech or anything like that, Mitch at Haltech.com. Um, that's probably the best place to get me. Or on the phone, on the uh, tech line at, or at on the tech in Australia. Line. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. It's been a really great chat there. Not often we get to jump into that level of detail on something that is pushing towards world record levels on the drag strip. So we certainly wish uh, Anthony and yourself all the best as that car continues to get developed. As we've said, 580 on after three passes, the future is certainly bright and I look forward to seeing it uh, take on the two Js at the front end of that field. <laughs> Cheers for your time there, Mitch. Awesome, thanks a lot. If you enjoyed this episode of Tuned In with Mitch Smith, we'd love it if you could drop a review on your chosen podcasting platform. These reviews really help us to grow our audience and that in turn helps us to continue to get bigger and better guests. To say thanks, each week we'll be picking a random reviewer and sending them out an HPA t-shirt anywhere in the world. This is a great place as well to ask any questions you might have. I'll do my best to answer them if your review gets picked. So this week a big shout out to Francois DeWitt who's said, as always, awesome podcast and filled with great knowledge and humour. Have to admit I find myself always waiting for the next episode, always fun listening to the podcast while working or even on my commute home from work. Courses are also well planned out and easy to understand if you have a little technical understanding, you guys are definitely living the dream. Well Francois, thanks for your comments there, we are doing our best and I'm glad to hear that obviously it seems to be hitting the mark. If you get in touch with us with your sizing and shipping details, we'll fire off a fresh tea straight out to you. All right, that concludes our interview. And before we sign off, I just wanted to mention for anyone who's been perhaps hiding under a rock and hasn't heard of High Performance Academy before, we are an online training school and we specialize in teaching a range of performance automotive topics, everything from engine tuning and engine building through to wiring, car suspension and wheel alignment, uh, data analysis and race driver education. Now remember, you've got that coupon code. You can use podcast75 at the checkout to get seven. $75 off the purchase of your first course. You'll find our full course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses. Important to mention that when you purchase a course from us, that course is yours for life as well. It never expires. You can rewatch the course as many times as you like, whenever you like. The purchase of a course will also give you three months of access to our gold membership. That gives you access to our private members only forum, which is the perfect place to get answers to your specific questions. You'll also get access to our regular weekly members webinars, which is where we touch on a particular topic in the performance automotive realm. We dive into that topic for about an hour. If you can watch live, you can ask questions and get answers in real time. If the time zones don't work for you, that's fine too. You're going to get access as a gold member to our previous webinar archive. We've got close to 300 hours of existing content in that archive. It is an absolute gold mine. So remember that coupon code PODCAST75. Check out our course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses.